Well, hello, everybody. I'm Bob Rambo, teaching pastor at Christ United Methodist Church in Jackson. And thank you for joining us for this last uh, session of this study uh, on the book of Revelation. Uh, last week, I did a quick recap of the movement of Revelation. I want to do that again to help us so that we can just follow the flow of John's message uh, to the church. Well, in chapter one, the first half introduces us to the book as a letter, a revelation, a prophecy from God to Jesus, from Jesus to an angel, from an angel to John, and ultimately from John the prophet to the church. The second half of chapter one reveals the first of several visions that John witnesses, which uh, this first one is a vision of Jesus standing among seven lampstands, which represent seven real churches found in Asia Minor, Western Turkey uh, today. Uh, chapters two and three of Revelation contain brief messages from Jesus to those seven churches. The churches are facing the growing threat of persecution for following Jesus. So the, the messages are similar uh, to all in that they address specific uh, situations, and they offer varying words of encouragement or criticism, and in some cases, both. Chapter four of Revelation, excuse me, pulls back the curtain of heaven and allows uh, readers a, a, a glimpse of the truth about life from God's perspective, and the truth is that God is still seated on the throne no matter how crazy things may seem uh, in the world. Chapter five of Revelation uh, begins to reveal what is happening and what will happen uh, and tells of how God will save his people, but God will not save his people through force or violence, but through the work of the lamb who was slain. God will save the world through the lamb's faithfulness uh, to God's mission and through the lamb's sacrificial love for the world which in turn sets a pattern for how God's people on earth are to live and how to bear witness uh, to God on earth. Chapter six involves uh, the unsealing of a scroll that will uh, unleash a series of uh, judgment warnings on the world. Uh, these judgments are going to be repeated twice and described each time in more detail, but they all refer to the same set of judgments. Uh, uh, but in the midst of all of this waiting, God's people suffer and they cry out, how long, O Lord? So chapter 7 of Revelation assures the persecuted church on earth that, that uh, uh, though there will be suffering, uh, until Jesus comes again, that God will preserve, God will seal uh, people uh, on earth uh, of every race, tribe, uh, and, and tongue who will uh, follow him and carry on this work. Uh, the number 144,000 is used to represent uh, the church, and it assures those who uh, are faithful to death, that they will be close to the Lamb and close to the throne of God. Uh, then in Revelations chapter 8 and 9, uh, we get the blowing of trumpets that describe in greater detail the judgments uh, that are happening and will happen. Uh, these judgments, uh, an important uh, note, uh, are acts of mercy uh, designed not to harm people necessarily, but to bring people to repentance. But the problem is people don't repent. So uh, chapters 10 and 11 of Revelation disclose this mysterious plan of God for the salvation of the world. Uh, chapter 10 shows us that judgment alone doesn't lead people to repentance. Uh, but chapter 11 uh, reveals that through the faithful suffering and witness of God's people, that many will come uh, return uh, to God. Uh, but what these chapters uh, also reveal is that there is no miraculous escape. There is no rapture of the church to escape tribulation. The church instead will go through tribulation. And chapter 12 of Revelation functions 
as a flashback that shows how we got here in the first place. It takes us all the way back to Genesis chapter three and uh, shows us that from the beginning almost of time, there's been this unseen spiritual struggle between God and Satan, but Satan banished from heaven is allowed to come to earth for a time. And here on earth, Satan, who is described as a dragon, uh, works to deceive God's people and to destroy God's people. Uh, chapter 13 uh, describes how Satan uh, works to deceive and destroy God's people uh, through uh, the cooperation of uh, collaborators. And, and while these collaborators' uh, names and faces change throughout history, at the end of the first century, Rome was collaborating with Satan. Uh, Rome is referred to as the beast, uh, one of two symbols that Revelation uses for Rome. Uh, so Rome and its emperors spread the deception that idolatry and immorality and material wealth are the answers to all of our problems. Uh, but Rome also utilizes uh, a second beast, also called a false prophet, to help accomplish its goal of converting people to Rome's way of life. And this second beast uh, is a reference to the network of government officials and local governments who enforce Roman law and, and also punish those who don't play along. So John identifies this network using the number 666, uh, using the ancient uh, practice of gematria, uh, where uh, numbers in Hebrew and Greek are assigned numerical values. The number 666 comes out to mean Neron Caesar, uh, uh, an evil Nero-like figure. Uh, Nero was dead by the time Revelation was written, but uh, what Revelation is saying is someone like Nero, who was the first Roman emperor to persecute Christians, uh, someone like Nero is in power now, and uh, it's like having Nero all over again. But then Revelation 14 announces suddenly the fall of Babylon, which is the other symbol Revelation uses for Rome. Babylon is the ancient symbol for all the seductive influences that pull people away from God. So John refers to Rome as the latest Babylon. Uh, now, Rome will eventually self-destruct, as does every brutal oppressive system, uh, but Revelation 14 also looks forward uh, to the time when the righteous will be vindicated and the wicked will be judged. Uh, so we're given images of two harvests, a harvest of good grain and a harvest of bad grapes that symbolize the righteous and the unrighteous. In chapter 15, uh, Revelation offers another glimpse of heaven in which God is praised and God is poised to execute judgment on those who oppose God's kingdom. And chapter 16 uh, is the point in the future, uh, not here yet, but the point in the future when God decides he's shown enough patience with people and begins to set the end of all things in motion. Events in the world will converge into a time when the lamb will engage the dragon and overcome evil once and for all. Chapter 17 and 18 show that when Jesus returns, those who have thrown their support behind the beast, behind the culture, will be uh, saddened and shocked. And chapter 19 finally brings the long-awaited, much-anticipated Battle of Armageddon, only it turns out to be a total mismatch. Uh, in fact, it may be that Armageddon doesn't refer to some future battle between human armies, but actually refers to the victory that Jesus won on the cross and in his resurrection. Roman, uh, Revel uh, rather, Revelation 19 also shows Jesus, the lamb, preparing to welcome his faithful bride and 
that is the faithful people of God. And that's where we are moving into this final section, which focuses on Revelation 20, uh, 21 and 22. Now, the final images of Revelation are extremely moving and ex extremely powerful. In fact, the closing scenes uh, of the movie, The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, are actually modeled on the closing scenes from the book of Revelation. In case you're not familiar with it, Lord of the Rings uh, is the Bible story written in a 20th century version of apocalyptic literature. The images and symbols of Lord of the Rings are J.R.R. Tolkien's way of telling the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Aragorn, the hero, the one pictured on your screen. He is the Christ figure in the movie, the descendant of Middle-earth's great king who comes to set Middle-earth free. And when Middle-earth is finally free from the evil influence of Sauron, uh, uh, people are healed. The earth once more is a garden and life is good again. And Revelation 20 uh, begins to point us to that imagery. Now, Revelation 20 is difficult to understand because as he has done throughout Revelation, John the prophet uses word pictures to describe spiritual realities. And none of this is meant to be taken literally. John is using symbolic language to talk about spiritual reality. Uh, John sees an angel uh, moving uh, from heaven with the key to a bottomless pit and a heavy chain. Satan previously had been cast out of heaven. He's given limited ability to work uh, havoc on earth. And Satan has spread his influence through the beast, but now the beast Satan worked through has been eliminated. Satan is alone and weakened. So in, in verse 2 of chapter 20, the angel seizes and binds and throws Satan into a, a bottomless pit for a thousand years, further limiting his influence. Uh, and uh, he locked the pit so that Satan couldn't deceive anyone for a period of time. Uh, uh, now, this period of time we're told in Revelation is a thousand years. Uh, and this thousand year period is known biblically as the millennium. It's, a, it's to be a time of peace on earth when God's kingdom grows, when people can respond to God's grace. Uh, this idea of a millennium first appeared in the writings of Jewish rabbis who believed the Messiah would reign on earth for a thousand years before the end of history. Well, it's actually patterned on creation week in Genesis 1 that culminates uh, all of God's work with Sabbath rest. Uh, so uh, the, the thing that we need to remember is that Christians hold uh, a variety of views on the millennium. And and most of us have been told or taught that the millennium will be a literal thousand year period of peace on earth when the world will again be like a paradise. The, the lion and the lamb will lie, lie down together. But Christians have different views of the millennium. And I'm mentioning them uh, in the order that they're shown on your screen on this handy chart I found online. First of all, there's what's known as post tribulation uh, millennialism. And, and what this means is that people uh, who believe the church will not be raptured, will go through tribulation, then Christ will return and establish a thousand year reign before the final judgment with everything culminating with the coming of the new heaven and earth, which is actually the view I tend to agree with. The second view, the one in pink on your screen, this is the dispensational pre-tribulation view of the millennium uh, because uh, dispensationalists believe that Christ will rapture believers first before the great tribulation. Then after seven years of suffering, Christ will return. Uh, 
uh, he will reign on earth for a thousand years before the final judgment. And, and this is the left behind interpretation of uh, the millennium. The third view, the one in yellow on your screen, is what's known as the post-millennial uh, view of, uh, of the millennium, uh, which simply says that at the end of time, the millennium will take place. Uh, this will be followed by Jesus' second coming and the final judgment and the coming of the new heaven and the new earth. And then uh, finally, uh, the, the, the view at the bottom of your screen uh, is, represents the amillennial view of the millennium, uh, which teaches that really uh, we're, in the, we're in the millennium now, that the talk of, uh, uh, of a literal uh, millennium is, is not really accurate, that it's symbolic, that, uh, that we are coexisting on earth right now along with the powers of evil, and at the end of time, Christ will return and the judgment will take place. Uh, Jesus actually told a parable about wheat and tares growing together side by side. This is uh, where this is the basis for those who hold the amillennial uh, point of view about the millennium. Now, I want to just point out that whichever of these views you hold, they all share certain things in common. And the things they share in common are the belief that Jesus will return a second time that he will destroy the forces of evil once and for all. He will establish God's kingdom on earth for a time. So as we wrap up just uh, this brief uh, uh, conversation about the millennium, I share with you this quote from Dr. Ben Witherington III, who says, the debate about the millennium has been waged for centuries in the Christian church and shows no sign of abating in our time. But the earliest commentators on Revelation, those who were most nearly in touch with the original thinking about John's apocalyptic work, were almost all convinced that John was speaking about a real messianic millennium at the end of human history that would transpire after the final return of Christ. So in Revelation 20, verse 4, what we find is that the dragon is thrown into the bottomless pit for the millennium. Uh, the saints who have died are resurrected so they can share in the reign of Christ on earth. And John refers to this uh, as the first uh, resurrection. Uh, John is, is, is talking uh, about an image that he borrows heavily from Ezekiel 37 in the Valley of Dry Bones vision. And he makes a point to say that those who share in the first resurrection are now priests of God. They have no fear of the second death, which will come at the final judgment and involve uh, eternal separation from God. In verse 7 of chapter 20, Satan is briefly released. And let's just be honest, why this is done is a mystery. Uh, at, at the death and resurrection of Jesus, Satan fell, was cast out of heaven. When Jesus returns, Satan is cast into the abyss, the bottomless pit. His brief release is probably to warn us that Satan never changes. Evil will be with us until the very end. So Satan, the deceiver of humanity, continues to deceive as long as allowed. Gog and Magog uh, are mentioned here. These represent the nations of the world, not specific nations or peoples like Russia or China, because we're told uh, an army is gathered from every corner of the earth. And Satan gathers this army and attacks the beloved city. Uh, this is likely another way of talking about the saints and and humanity in general, not Jerusalem. What matters is that like Armageddon, Satan gathers an army for one more battle that fizzles because fire from heaven, not human armies, but fire from heaven comes down and consumes them. The lake, uh, rather the devil is then passed into the lake of fire to join the beast and the false prophet in torment forever. 
and we discussed this last week, whether hell is a literal fiery lake, whether it's a literal bottomless pit, whether it is literal outer darkness, hell is real. And I share this quote with you from Dr. Ben Witherington III. Uh, Dr. Witherington says, while John may not believe in literal flames in hell, he believes that image accurately sums up the mystery, or rather misery and painfulness of being in a place where one experiences the absence of the presence of God forever. Well, following, uh, following hell, uh, the consignment of the devil uh, to hell, uh, John then describes what is often referred to as the great white throne judgment, because it takes place before a great white throne that is obviously uh, occupied by God, the eternal one. Uh, and this is the only judgment scene John the prophet mentions, a, a, a judgment scene in which everyone is there. Uh, I mentioned very early in the study that the Schofield Bible with dispensational theology footnotes uh, was very influential in the spread of dispensational theology. Uh, the Schofield Bible uh, uh, says that there are seven different judgments, but Revelation does not have a series of judgments. Uh, it only speaks of the great white throne judgment. And in verse 12 of chapter 20, John sees all the dead resurrected standing before God's throne, the books that record our actions uh, are opened. All the dead are judged according to their deeds. And our, our deeds refer to more than simply being saved. Once people are saved, people are to follow Jesus and to live morally, ethically, compassionately. God expects us to practice and live the faith we profess. And those whose names are in the book of life are granted entry into God's presence, but those whose names are not in the book of life are, are cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. Uh, the, the final judgment then prepares the way for the ending of Revelation, which is the coming of the new heaven and the new earth. And with that, uh, we transition into Revelation chapter 21. Uh, the Apostle Paul says that, uh, or rather, uh, John the prophet says that uh, uh, Revelation draws to a close with a glorious vision. Uh, scenes of battle and death are, are now gone, and what we're witnessing now are scenes of life and celebration. In verse 1 of chapter 21, John sees a new heaven and earth. The old ones are gone along with the sea. John's vision reveals uh, that God will not only save souls, but God will restore creation as well. So the salvation of the world actually includes the world. In fact, the Apostle Paul referenced this in Romans chapter 8, verse 21, where Paul says that the creation itself looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Uh, as the resurrection of the dead brought an end to death itself, now God's creation itself will be healed. And John then sees the new Jerusalem coming down from God. Uh, this is very, very important because instead of Christians going up to be with God, God comes down to earth. God's home will be with God's people. Uh, many scholars believe that the New Jerusalem already exists in heaven as the dwelling place of the saints who have died in the Lord and that it will descend at the end of time to become the home on earth of all true believers. Now, this idea of a heavenly Jerusalem didn't uh, begin with John. It came from a very long tradition in the Old Testament and uh, extra biblical outside the Bible Jewish writings. Uh, Jewish apocalyptic prophecy frequently spoke about a, a new Jerusalem uh, as a place where the saints would enjoy God forever. 
And, and these prophecies seem to envision a real city located on the spot of the present Jerusalem. And it would either be a renewal of the existing city or a replacement for it altogether. Notice that John is purposely describing the new heaven as a city. This is in contrast to Babylon. Babylon was one kind of city. The new Jerusalem is another. Because cities, what are they? They are expressions. They're examples of human community. The places where people live out life, which is uh, an essential part of being human. The, the myth of owning my own place far removed from everyone, that's a modern invention. In John's view, the New Jerusalem will be the fulfillment of every human dream, every longing for the ideal home that provides community and security. And in the midst of this, John hears a shout. Uh, God's home is now among his people. God is to dwell forever with his people. We could call this Emmanuel theology uh, because as in the incarnation of Jesus coming uh, to earth in physical form, now God is forever to dwell among his people. So the end is not believers going up to heaven. It's God in heaven coming down to earth permanently. And this scene in Revelation 21, again, it's the fulfillment of Ezekiel 37. Uh, all pain and sorrow are going to be gone forever. It's going to be marked, uh, this new creation, all the powers that oppose God and diminish life. It will be characterized by the presence of God. For John, at the end uh, of all things, we don't uh, we don't meet an event, we meet a person. God doesn't just bring the end, God is the end in a wonderful and powerfully transforming way. Uh, and in this new community, the separation between God and his people is totally removed. Uh, they dwell together in harmony and fellowship. The one sitting on the throne says, look, I am making all things new. Uh, uh, the, the vision revealed all the way back in Revelation 4 is fulfilled. Uh, God is the creator. Creation turned away from God. But God doesn't throw creation over uh, away and start over. He renews creation. Uh, so notice, God doesn't make all new things. God makes all things new. And... and uh, there's another promise here in verses 7 and 8 of Revelation 21, uh, the promise of blessing to those who conquer uh, and a warning of judgment for those who are evil. Uh, remember, this is being read uh, in the first century. Uh, and, and so specific sins are mentioned to encourage people in the seven churches to turn away from them. And they are simultaneously being encouraged to faithfulness uh, in order to be able to share in the holy city that will come uh, at the end of time. Uh, John is taken to this new Jerusalem in verse 10, and the city is a wall structure where everything is perfectly laid out, adorned with precious stones. Here again, this is an intentional contrast between this holy city and evil Babylon. Babylon was the dwelling place of evil. The new Jerusalem is the dwelling place of God and his holy people. And, and Revelation 21 really describes the, the quality of what uh, the new Jerusalem will be like rather than the quantification of it. Uh, the shape of the city uh, uh, is a square, a cube, if you will. And it's almost certainly meant to evoke memories of the temple because the cube was thought to be, in the ancient world, the, the, the most perfect of all Jews. Uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, about 10 years ago, a first century synagogue was discovered uh, along the shores of the Sea of Galilee at a place 
uh, uh, and 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 one of the things found within this uh, this synagogue was a strange cube sitting in the very middle of the synagogue on the ground, and and nobody is exactly sure what uh, this cube is all about, but some archaeologists have come to believe that they think it is uh, meant to represent the temple in Jerusalem, uh, in all of its glory and all of its perfection and. John uses uh, uh, the image of the New Jerusalem as being four square. It's a cube uh, as a way of saying it is absolutely splendid and perfect in every way. So uh, inside uh, Jerusalem's temple uh, was a sacred space known as the Holy of Holies, where God was said to dwell. Uh, uh, well, in this uh, new city of Jerusalem, the whole city is a holy of holies. I have uh, uh, put on the screen for you uh, an interesting discovery made in southern Israel at a place called Arad, because inside uh, this city, far removed from Jerusalem, was a replica of the holy of holies in Jerusalem. This uh, is on site uh, at a rod, and it is a facsimile of what was found. This is the original Holy of Holies found uh, in this ancient city of Arad, which has now been placed in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. Uh, uh, this was actually forbidden to have this kind of thing outside of Jerusalem, but here it is. It, it, it happened. But John's point is that in the new Jerusalem, there won't be one designated place that God dwells. The whole city will be holy, and God's presence will be everywhere. And uh, another indication that John is only uh, using symbolic language here, that he's not being literal, it's found in the description of the city walls, 216 feet with 12 gates, three gates on each side. Only the gates of the New Jerusalem are not designed to keep people out. They're designed to give people access to God's presence. And it, it's difficult to speak of God and who God is and what God's transcendent world is like. So one way John does this is to describe what uh, is not. And one thing John uh, says uh, that in the new Jerusalem, there is no sea. Now, uh, for John, sea was more uh, than a barrier that separated him from the churches in Asia Minor that he loved. Remember, John is exiled on the island of Patmos, and, and these churches that John cares so deeply for are some 20, 30 miles away, separated by open water. Uh, even more than this, uh, sea, water, was for the Jewish people a symbol of chaos and, and everything anti-God. Uh, but in the end, we're told, the sea will be no more. There will be no tears, no death, no sorrow, no pain, all that robs life of joy will be gone forever. No cowards, no faithless, no polluters, no murderers, no fornicators, no sorcerers, no idolaters, no liars. The New Jerusalem will be a place where right and justice prevail as the will of God. And we're even told there will be no temple. Uh, I know uh, dispensational theology, uh, which reads Revelation uh, literally, uh, there is a movement to build a third temple in Jerusalem, but the new Jerusalem uh, will not need a temple, uh, for the whole city is holy. God is in their midst, and there will be no need for sun or moon because God is light and all other forms of light will be irrelevant. Uh, John is seeing a world 
that was perverted by rebellion against God, being purified and redeemed from bondage far as the curse is found, which uh, are the words of the Christmas hymn, uh, Joy to the World. Uh, John says that no evil will ever darken the doors of the New Jerusalem, only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Uh, and so what we have is after a long story in which people are constantly being uh, drawn away from the one true God, Revelation is ending with all the nations of the world coming together to worship the one true God. The story that began all the way back in Genesis 1 in a paradise is going to end in a paradise. And that takes us to the final chapter uh, of Revelation, chapter 22. Here's a quote from Ben Witherington, where Ben Witherington writes, the final vision in Revelation is about heaven and its holiness, the invasion of earth by heaven, and the entire sanctification of the earthly realm. John uh, would have been very concerned indeed about those who pursue a spirituality that negates, withdraws from, or ignores the world for the sake of other worldliness. He would not be any happier with certain forms of erratic theolo theology that allows people to neglect their jobs as caretakers of the earth just because they are convinced this world is going to hell eventually anyway. So Revelation 22 uh, begins to pull everything together. Uh, there's a repetition of themes that John has shared throughout uh, uh, this, this vision. Those themes include the worship of God alone, uh, the reminder that I am coming uh, soon, and the reminder to readers to be faithful to the end. Now, John sees a river uh, filled with the water of life flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. And, and this is drawn from the Old Testament. Psalm 65, verse 9 says, The river of God has plenty of water. It provides a, a bountiful harvest of grain, for so you, Lord, have ordered it. And, and in John's vision, there are fruit trees, symbols of life and, and prosperity and healing. The, the vision of redemption is showing that creation itself is being redeemed. Uh, symbols of life, God, the source of life, God wanting everyone to live abundantly. And Revelation 22 says that the New Jerusalem is an active place. Uh, the eternal city is not a place where everybody sits on a cloud where, where we just rest all the time. It is a place of holy activity. And part of that holy activity is participating in the worship of, of God and the Lamb. And, and we're told that God's servants will see God's face. Verse 4, to see the king's face in antiquity was to be granted an audience with the king. And for John, this can only mean that not only will we be in close proximity to God's presence, we will enjoy a relationship of absolute trust and transparency. I love the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. Paul says, now we see dimly as in a mirror, but then we will see face to face. And this is what John is talking about as well. And John assures people in verse 6, that everything you have seen and heard is true, that you can trust God to bring this about. And then Jesus says in verse 7, I'm coming soon. Blessed are those who obey the words of prophecy written in this book. Uh, remember, biblical prophecy speaks primarily to the time that people are living in, which means that for the readers of first century uh, Revelation, uh, they're hearing a call to repent, to persevere, to be faithful uh, in difficult times, and to trust in God and the Lamb. 
And then in verse uh, 8, John again falls at the feet of an angel, an act of worship. And again, the angel redirects the worship uh, to God alone. The angel says, don't seal up the words of this book. In other words, this is a message that must be shared. And what must be shared is that those who do evil must turn away from it. The righteous must live righteously. And the holy must continue to be holy in an unholy world. Remember all the way back in Revelation 1, God identified himself as the Alpha and Omega. Now in Revelation 22, verse 13, it's Jesus who says the same thing about himself. And Jesus adds to this, I am coming soon to repay all people for their deeds. Blessed are those who wash their robes. Uh, and even though those words aren't in red letters as if spoken by Jesus, I wonder if they shouldn't be. So to the very end, look at verses 17 and 18. Revelation continues to call people to repentance and the faith in Jesus. Let all those who are thirsty come. It also warns that no one should add to or take away from this message. That is, don't mess with the integrity of the message of this letter. The good news, verse 20, Jesus is coming soon. The church's response is, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And in Christianity, every generation could be the last generation. Therefore, each generation must always be ready to meet the Lord. And then the final words of Revelation, like the rest of the book, are a message of hope and encouragement. Revelation ends as it begins, uh, a letter from an exile pastor uh, to be read aloud in worship to the churches of Asia Minor. And that brings us to the close of Revelation with a few final thoughts. Many people do believe in the view of dispensational theology and the rapture, and I always want to be respectful of those who hold that view, and I want to sincerely apologize for the times in this uh, study when maybe I've not been as respectful as I intended. But I want to remind you uh, what I said the very first session. I disconnected myself from that view of Revelation over a period of years of intense study, and I did so for a variety of reasons. And here are the reasons for my decision. I learned, first of all, that dispensational theology didn't even come into being until the mid-19th century. I discovered through my own study and the work of others that dispensational theology does not interpret scripture in its original context, which is absolutely essential to biblical, uh, accurate biblical study. Uh, I did it in part because all the Testament's uh, prophecies in the Old Testament refer to God's original people, the Jews, not to the modern political state of Israel. They are not the same thing. Uh, so all the Old Testament promises about Messiah have been fulfilled in Jesus. Uh, I, as I distance myself because dispensational theology uh, separates Jews in the Old Testament from Christians in the New Testament, but the New Testament defines God's people as Jews and Gentiles who are together united in Jesus. Um, Modern Israel as an extension of biblical Israel. It's a major part of dispensational theology. That's why the formation of the nation of Israel in 1948 is considered so important. But keep in mind that no New Testament author, nor Jesus himself, ever looked for a fulfillment of prophecies that had to do with the land of Israel. In fact, when Jesus' own disciples pressed him about this, Jesus always pushed back, which means that the idea 
uh, of a third Jewish temple uh, as a major part of dispensational theology ignores the fact that Revelation 21, 22 says there will be no need for a third temple when Jesus returns. Uh, I distance myself from dispensational theology because I've just found nowhere in 40 years of study, uh, nowhere does the New Testament teach two returns of Jesus. The most quoted text, uh, for instance, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18, which talks about rising to meet Jesus in the air. Even these texts that are fundamental to dispensational theology have been taken out of context and misinterpreted. Uh, they're, they're referring about what happens when Jesus returns. They don't describe the rapture of the church. Uh, but perhaps more compelling than anything else is nowhere does the New Testament or Revelation suggest that Christians somehow get a free pass when it comes to avoiding persecution and, and suffering. Uh, Revelation was written by a first century Christian for first century Christians. And it can only mean for us what it first meant for them. It makes no sense at all to believe uh, God put a book in the Bible that would only apply to people 2,000 years later. And I want to end by saying this. Salvation doesn't depend on whether you believe in a rapture or not. But I do believe a healthy theology that is consistent with New Testament theology does depend on which view we choose. Uh, dispensational theology intentionally or not, encourages people to make certain choices. You, you view yourselves as stewards of the earth, or you use up the resources because the end is coming soon and it really doesn't matter. You either distance yourself from people in the world, or you engage with our neighbors because these are the people who Jesus loves, and our faith is always tied up with theirs. You either uh, ignore uh, a, a concern for the poor because all that matters is saving souls, or you demonstrate compassion for the poor and needy because that's what Jesus taught us to do. Well, in the end, all of us must make our own conclusions and make our own choices. I pray that you will choose well so that your theology can help you follow Jesus in the world. Blessings go in peace. Amen.